My name is Candy Crosby Hastings, and this is a video for U.S. History 512 at Liberty University. Hebrews 13.3 reminds us, remember those in prison as if you were bound with them, and those who are mistreated as if you were suffering with them. That's the NIV translation. Jesus taught in Matthew 25 that the righteous of God are those who care for those who are hungry and thirsty and in prison. And in fact, those who do not do these things can expect an eternity reserved for the devil and his angels. Those are very strong words. When we think of the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments of the United States Constitution, we often think of our freedom of religion or our freedom to assemble and even protest, or especially recently, our right to bear arms. However, one amendment that we often do not contemplate, quite honestly, because we probably feel it doesn't directly affect us, is the Eighth Amendment. From the website for the Bill of Rights Institute, the Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution reads, Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. As someone who works one-on-one -on -one with inmates at the Hutchinson Correctional Facility in Hutchinson, Kansas, for prison ministries volunteering, this is an amendment that I do take very seriously, and I would like to explore that further today. According to the article, Revival of the Eighth Amendment, Development of Cruel Punishment Doctrine by the Supreme, by James S. Campbell, Patrick Henry was actually one of the first people to recognize the need for some kind of protection to be put in place to keep American Congress from falling into a mindset already prevalent in France, Germany, and Spain. A mindset that allowed torturing of suspected criminals into confession. This was, by the way, was at the Virginia Convention to ratify the Constitution that Henry spoke about this. The same idea, though, was also presented at the Massachusetts Convention. So clearly there was a need at this time that people recognized for this type of protection. That doesn't mean, though, that there wasn't scrutiny. I'd like to read a little bit of a quote here from a representative of Livermore. This is quoted in the Campbell article. And this was at the first session of the House of Representatives. Livermore said, No cruel and unusual punishment is to be inflicted. It is sometimes necessary to hang a man. Villains often deserve whipping, perhaps having their ears cut off. But are we in the future to be prevented from inflicting these punishments because they are cruel? Oh my goodness, who can imagine? However, even the predecessors of the, of the Constitution did have some of these provisions in place. According to the article Cruel and Unusual Punishments by David Fellman, the phrases used in the American Bill of Rights were derived from the English Bill of Rights of 1689. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 also promised protection against excessive bells and against any kind of cruel and unusual punishment. Feldman believes that the primary problem with the wording, cruel and unusual punishment, lies in the fact of whether that should be interpreted as just the limit of the mode of punishment or whether that should actually limit the severity of the punishment. Throughout the history of the United States, this amendment has evolved to take on different meanings, which we'll get into a little more here in a minute. But as Campbell points out, one of the most mentioned topics under cruel and unusual punishment is capital punishment or the death penalty. It has generally been decided, according to Campbell, that capital punishment does not fall under cruel and unusual punishment unless it's administered in a way that tortures. However, according to William B. Barry III in the article Death Repudiated, this does not mean that as late as the 20th century, the constitutionality of capital punishment in light of the Eighth Amendment has not been questioned. According to Barry's information, there are specifically three Supreme Court justices, Justices Powell, Blackman, and Stevens, who as late as the 1970s upheld the constitutionality of the death penalty, but now question that. He reports that all three of these justices now believe that the issues surrounding state administration of capital punishment cannot be remedied, capital punishment must be completely abolished. There is no doubt interpretations of the Eighth Amendment have changed throughout history, as I just alluded to. According to Feldman, for instance, whipping or flogging used to be allowed under the Eighth Amendment. The reasoning was that parents had the right to whip their children. At other times, the forced sexual sterilization of those found guilty of crimes was not upheld because psychological punishment that is deemed inhumane is just as bad as the physical. Cruel and unusual punishment does also extend to inmates in the prison system, according to Fellman. According to the website AmericanBar.org, the personal dignity of all inmates must be respected at all times. I can say that as a volunteer, again, in the prison system, the importance of human dignity within correctional facilities is always stressed. Any violation of this dignity must be reported to the proper authorities, and rightfully so. Therefore, while everyone may be concerned about our violation of our constitutional rights, I think it's of utmost important that we recognize the constitutional rights of everyone, whether they're imprisoned or not. Each individual is important.